Uh, okay, I think that's all. So I can now introduce uh, our today's speaker. So it's my, my big pleasure to introduce uh, Giovanni Alberti. Giovanni is a tenure track assistant professor at the Department of Mathematics at the University of Genova and affiliated within the Machine Learning Genoa Center, Malga. He received his PhD at the University of Oxford in uh, 2014 and held two doctoral positions at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris and the, uh, at the ETH in Zurich. His research focuses on PDEs, applied harmonic analysis, and uh, uh, their interactions with inverse problems, machine learning, and imaging. Giovanni was the recipient of the Giacchino Iapichino Prize for Mathematical Analysis in 2017, and of the Eurasian Association of Inverse Problems Young Scientist Award for Distinguished Contribution in Inverse Problems in 2018. Uh, today, Giovanni will present his work on infinite dimensional inverse problems with finite measurements. And uh, uh, as always, I uh, remind the audience to please use the Q&A button or the chat to ask questions at the end of the talk. And of course, we'll unmute you to interact directly with Giovanni. So Giovanni, please, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very, thank you very much. Luca for the invitation and for the introduction. I'm very glad and honored to be able to give a talk in this very nice seminars, seminar series. Um, so let, let me just start with one simple example that somehow will guide my invest investigation throughout the whole talk, which is the Calderon problem, which is the mathematical model for electrical impedance tomography. This has been discussed already many times along these couple of years of this seminar series. So I will try to be as, as quick as possible and fix some notation here. The, the, the problem is to reconstruct the conductivity sigma in a bounded domain omega. So say this is the bounded domain omega. You have a function sigma, which for example is, is uh, this one is just, uh, is just one example. And the physical model is the conductivity equation, which basically is a simpler model for Maxwell's equations in case of, of electrical currents. So this is the equation inside the domain where sigma is the conductivity, u is the electric potential, and this is a boundary condition. So this is a Neumann type boundary condition. So it means that we are applying a current on the boundary of the domain. So this is the physical model. And the data that we can measure is the so-called Neumann to Dirichlet map, which means that basically every time we inject a boundary current on the, on, on the boundary G through the electrodes on the boundary, we measure the corresponding potential U on the boundary. So this is why it's called Neumann to Dirichlet data because this G is nothing but the Neumann data of the PDE and U is the Dirichlet data. So this is somehow my data, which is in, in a simple setting represented by this, by this image here. And note that the map and sigma is linear from these two spaces, simply because this PD is linear. However, the map that goes from sigma to n sigma is highly nonlinear because this PD in sigma is highly nonlinear. So this is the data and sigma is what I measure, supposing that I can inject all possible boundary currents. And the inverse problem, which is exactly the Calderon problem that has been studied a lot over the last 40 years is going back. Namely, we're supposed to know n of sigma, so the Neumann to Dirichlet data, and we want to reconstruct sigma. So the inverse problem is to go back here. Um, so there are many, many theoretical results here. We just focus on a couple of them. The first one is injectivity, namely whether the map that from sigma goes into n of sigma is injective. And the answer is yes, this map is injective and indeed, and sigma can is uniquely determined if you know n of sigma. So basically there's only one way to go back. And, and this is true, this is always true in two dimensions and it's true in three dimensions if the conductivity is smooth enough. I don't want to go into the details, things become very technical and complicated immediately. So this is a very interesting topic of research, still active because somehow the, the 3D case in the non-smooth case is still open, uh, but it's something that I will not, I will not go into now. And the other aspect that I want to focus on is on the instability. So the inverse map. So when I say F minus one, it means going from N sigma to, to sigma is unstable. And unstable means that you only have this very weak log type stability estimate, which means that basically even if N of sigma one is very close to N of sigma two, 
this doesn't mean that sigma one and sigma two have to be so close because here there's a lock in between and the lock goes to infinity very slowly when when this one goes to zero when go, when this one sorry when the argument goes to infinity so this means that the there is a continuity but the continuity is super weak this is what's called log stability estimate so this is somehow the analytical counterpart of this phenomenon if we want to see a realization an image of what of, of what it, of what this means this is a simple this is an example of the reconstruction of this true sigma in this model, so in this model where we have this log type stability estimate, and what you get is this somehow very bad reconstruction. So, since you, um, you're familiar with inverse problems, you you see that here basically only the very low frequencies of my unknown are reconstructed, and that all the high frequencies are complete are completely washed away, and this basically just corresponds in the linear in a linearized regime. To having exponentially decaying singular values. So when when you have exponentially decaying singular values, this means basically they up to after a certain a certain threshold, all the high frequencies they are not you cannot trust them. Somehow the reconstruction is too affected by noise, and so basically that's what you get. And and this is no surprise if you just look at the PDE because this PDE is infinitely smoothing. What does it mean? It means that even if sigma has a jump here, so the, the, the sigma is not even continuous here, as soon as you move away, away a little bit from the, from the jump, and certainly when you are at the boundary, then the solution that you measure is infinite, is, is smooth, is actually infinite, is analytic, because here this is just a harmonic function outside the jump. And so basically you are just, you have an infinitely smoothing operator somehow. And so it's very, it's a, it's certainly understandable that this, this gives rise to a very unstable problem. Uh, so the question is how, how one can, can one solve this problem, overcome this problem? Of course, there are many ways to, to many options, and the theory of regularization is exactly what addresses these, these issues in inverse problems here. We'll just discuss one approach. But before going into that, let me just discuss a general model for inverse problem, because those ideas then can be applied to more general settings. And the model is the following. Basically, you just fix two Banach spaces, X and Y. X is the signal space that where, where my unknown lives, and Y is the data space, the space of the measurements. A is an open set where my forward map F is defined. So before F was just a Neumann to Dirichlet map. And the thing is that the PDE often appears in F if we have an inverse problem for partial differential equations. And so, F tends to be a complicated map, exactly like the one we saw before, the Neumann to Dirichlet map. The inverse problem, as before, consists in the reconstructing x from the knowledge of f of x. So if this is f of x, I just want to go back to go back to x. And if we want to characterize instability, this is a way to, to do so. And so basically, every time one has only a log type stability estimate, this means that the inverse problem is very unstable. So it's very difficult to, re to, to reconstruct the unknown if noise or, or modeling errors are present. And before I gave you an example of the Calderon problem with, that applies to electrical impedance tomography, however, this setup applies to many different domains. And somehow what I'm going to tell you later applies, can, can be applied to many different inverse problems. In this talk, I will only mention the Calderon problem and scattering problems. But I mean, many, many different uh, uh, practical problems and mathematical formulations do, do fit into this framework. All right. So the the as, as always, regularization uses somehow some prior knowledge on the unknown that we want to find. And the key observation here is that I want to obtain stability with structured signals. So the, 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 the key observation is that the objects that we are interested in, so the axes that we want to reconstruct, they are not arbitrary signals like the white Gaussian noise that you see here on the left. So we don't look in, at objects of this kind, but we always look here. This is a medical imaging applications. This may be the structure of the earth. This is maybe concrete with cracks. Anyway, we always look at objects that have some kind of structure. And this structure can be exploited in the inverse problem. In mathematical terms, we can say, I mean, this is, can be modeled by saying that text belongs to W, that is either a low dimensional subspace or submanifold of the ambient space X. And furthermore, X is often sparse in that space. 
which means that can be represented by few non-zero elements of a, of a suitable family of atoms. So why does this help? Um, this is, an, again, an example in the Calderon problem. And if you assume that your unknown is a piecewise constant function, you see that here one is able to obtain a reconstruction that is much, much better than the one that we, we obtained before. And from the mathematical point of view, it means that if you restrict to struct to structure signals in this prior class W, then instead of having a log stability estimate, you actually have a liquid stability estimate. And so the question that now we want to address is why is this true? Is it always true somehow that if you assume this a suitable uh, a priori assumption on the unknown, you move from log type to Lipschitz type stability estimate? And that's exactly what I want to address now. And the answer is, Yes, in the general setting, provided that, for example, that this is the first case I, I address, the class W is a finite dimensional subspace. So if you assume a priori that your unknowns live in a finite dimensional subspace, then you are fine under two main assumptions. The first one is that, well, you have to, to, to focus on a compact, compact and convex subspace of W, but this is usually fine. And then your map F has to be has to satisfy two main assumptions. First, it has to be globally injective. And for example, for the Calderon problem, it's fine because we have always have global injectivity. And the second one is the Frechet derivative restricted to W has to be injective again. And for example, for the Calderon problem, this is true. In all these cases, there always exists a positive constant C so that this Lipschitz stability estimate holds. So somehow you get much better stability than the log type stability estimate we had before. And just to give you an idea of how the proof goes, it's divided into, into two steps. In the first, uh, the first step is, is considering the case where x1, x2 are very far away. And this is, this is handled easily by using global injectivity somehow. The interesting case of using this assumption here, the interesting case is when x1 and, and x2 are close together, but here you just use a linearization argument and you approach the function with the, with the Frechet derivative, that is by using the inverse function theorem. And basically this, the Frechet derivative is, a, is an injective function between finite dimensional subspace. And so automatically the inverse is continuous. And so basically you get this Lipschitz stability estimate. Um, so this is again just the same statement. Let me just make a few more comments. Uh, this is an abstract result, but many, many people have studied Lipschitz stability estimates either for the Calderon problem or for, or for related inverse boundary problems in specific settings. So basically by looking precisely at the map F and this allows allow them to obtain explicit estimates on the constant C depending on the space W on the on the on the on W and basically you can understand how C behaves when the dimension of W goes to infinity for example. However the downside of all these results is that they all require the full Neumann to the reclaim map. So basically even if you, you are looking for an unknown living in a finite dimensional space, so basically you're looking for a finite number of measure of parameters, you want to reconstruct finitely many pieces of information, you still need an infinite dimensional measurement here. F of x1 and f of x2 are infinite dimensional objects. For the Calderon problem, this means that you need the full Neumann to Dirac claim map. And so why do we need infinite measurements? If we think about the Calderon problem, this is rather annoying because in theory, this would mean that I have to inject infinitely many currents and measure the corresponding infinitely many potentials. And so now I want to show that in fact, it's all, 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 almost always possible to reduce to going from infinite dimensional measurements to finite measurements. And this is how it can be done. So how, how, how do we model finite measurements? So on the left, we see the, the full measurement. So basically just the measurement f of x in an infinite dimensional space y. Finite measurements can be modeled by a sort of projection operator qn. And, and so basically, instead of measuring the whole f of x, you just measure qn of f of x. E, and qn of f of x will be in the range of this qn, supposing it's a, it's a finite rank operator. And of course, we need that qn somehow, as n goes to infinity, they approach the identity in a suitable sense. This suitable sense is rather complicated, so I prefer to give you just two examples. The first one is in the case when y is a Hilbert space. 
And this is rather easy. You just need to choose QN to be the orthogonal projection onto the first element of an orthonormal basis. So if you think about the Fourier basis, this QN is just a low pass filter. So basically measuring QN of f of x means that you just measure a low pass filter of your, of your data. So basically you don't need to measure the high frequencies. The measuring the low frequencies is enough. The second example, which is adapted to inverse boundary value problems, where the codomain is a space of operators, so it's not a Hilbert space, and it's a space of operators between Hilbert spaces. So in this case, the way to project an operator is to project it in this way. So if Y is an operator, you have to project before applying the operator and after applying the operator by using a projection as above. So again, in, uh, if we use a uh, Fourier basis, it's as if you don't need to input every possible current, you need to input currents up to a certain frequencies and measure the corresponding potentials again up to a certain frequencies and not, uh, and not the infinitely many frequencies. And so this is how to model finite measurements and the abstract result that we've obtained is basically saying that every time you have a Lipschitz stability estimate with infinitely many measurements, and, 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 this is, and this you have it every time you start from a finite dimensional uh, space under the assumption that I discussed before. So every time you have this inequality here, so this is an assumption basically was the conclusion of many theorems that I discussed before, automatically you get basically the same estimate, however, with finitely many measurements. So on the right, you have QN of F of X instead of F of X. The only price you pay is a slightly larger constant stability constant here. Uh, if one goes through the proof, uh, realize it, it realizes that actually n is not, that, that the proof is completely constructive, namely that the, the constant n is explicitly given and it's given so that this inequality is satisfied. So basically given a, a particular example, one can go through the calculations and calculate how many measurements actually they are, are actually needed. And, and I will give you in a, in a couple of slides an example for the Calderon problem. Uh, so somehow the way I see this result is an extension of the classical sampling theorems. Think about the Shannon sampling theorem for nonlinear and ill pose problems. Somehow what the Shannon sampling theorem says is that if you have a band limited functions in this particular with a certain band, then you can reconstruct it by taking measurements at a suitable sampling rate. And the sampling rate is exactly determined by the band. And this is a similar phenomenon here. We have finite measurements, while in the Shannon case, we, have, we still had infinitely many measurements. But still, what we are saying is that if you fix a prior class W, automatically we give you a recipe to select finitely many measurements to be able to reconstruct your unknown. And let me mention that there are many recently, the, many re related results have appeared in these somehow uh, uh, the connected to, the, to those uh, ideas, both in the deterministic settings, like, I, 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 like it, the one that I'm discussing here, or in the statistical setting. The statistical setting somehow means that the map QNs are not deterministic, but they, the, 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 but the functions f of x are sampled at random points. But this is something that I'm not going to discuss in this talk. All right, let me give you a couple of examples. The first one is the Calderon problem, which we discussed before, so it will be rather quick. So what the basically the application of, of the abstract result of the previous slide to this problem is the following. Anytime you have a Lipschitz stability estimate for the Calderon problem of this form, you get, and, and, and as I said before, there are many, many of these stability estimates have, be, have been obtained in the literature, then automatically you get almost the same stability estimate with a slightly larger constant C here, but with finitely many measurements. So again, this PN means that you project both the currents and the potentials. So both currents and potentials are taken in a finite dimensional, in finite dimensional spaces. So, and, and this is something that I mentioned before, the number of measurements, if we take a, a simple setting, so think about the unit disk, the boundary is just the torus, and we take this orthonormal basis on the boundary and PN can be chosen as the projection on the, onto the first capital N trigonometric current pattern. So this is PN is just a low pass filter on the torus. Then if you do the calculations, you realize that capital N is of the order of C squared here. 
So basically, can be the, the number of measurements can be explicitly computed. And in fact, for electrical impedance tomography in this problem, it's well known that the constant C is exponential in the dimension of W. There is nothing we can do about it because somehow the problem is severely imposed. But this nevertheless gives us a recipe to choose the number of measurements and gives also gives us also an indication of the fact that this approach is useful if those dimensions are small. That's why at the beginning I said low dimensional spaces. If you have a very high dimensional space, even though it's finite dimensional, it's still not enough because those constants explode very quickly. However, if you can somehow input in your, in your problem a strong prior, then this argument allows to, um, to exploit it to get a, a much better stability estimate. Mm -hmm. The second uh, inverse problem that I want to discuss is the inverse capturing problem. Here, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very quick, but the, 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 the idea is that we want to recover this uh, refractive index n from the knowledge of the full far, uh, full far field, the, sorry, for the far field pattern u infinite here. So basically, the idea is that you inject a, an incoming wave you measure the corresponding far field pattern at infinity and you want to recover n of z. So here it's, it's very quick, this slide, but basically D is, is denotes the, the direction of the incoming wave and it's chosen in S2, this one. So this is the incoming wave and X, X hat is the point, is the direction at which you measure the far field pattern. So usually the inverse problem is done by assuming that is solved by assuming that you inject all possible incoming waves for all possible directions and you measure the corresponding far field patterns at all possible locations x dagger at infinity x hat sorry at infinity our uh, sorry our approach allows us to basically reduce the number this number of measurements and instead of having all possible incoming waves and all possible sampling points you get exactly the same stability estimates however with finitely many incoming waves and with finitely many points on the sphere where you measure the far field pattern and these the number of those as before it is explicitly determined you see somehow that here you don't see explicitly a projection. Actually, those are sampling, those are samples. And the way to make samples, basically the sampling of functions projections is done via using the theory of, the theory of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So basically, if one uses reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, you transform the, 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 these samples into projections and then our abstract uh, approach can be applied. All right, so the second, Thing I want to address is whether we can go beyond sampling. So, so far, basically the number of measurements was directly proportional to the dimension of the space where my, my unknown lives. However, the theory of compressed sensing allowed, allowed us to basically go beyond the, the sampling regime and basically measure, uh, taking measures directly proportional to the sparsity of the unknown. So let's see whether this theory can also be applied to these inverse problems in PDE. And before doing this, let me just uh, spend one slide to recap, to do a very quick recap of the classical compressed sensing theory. Since I work with infinite dimensional inverse problems, I, I do the, the modeling directly in the infinite dimensional setup. So suppose that H is a Hilbert space of signals, say a certain function space, and capital F is a linear forward map. So basically each entry is nothing but the scalar product between U and the certain function psi of L. So psi of L is a, is a fixed family of H. Next, you fix another family of H, these phi J's, with respect to which my unknown U is sparse. So basically U is a, if, if, a, a, a linear combination of few elements of these phi J's and the, the zero norm denotes just the sparsity of U with respect to this dictionary phi J. Now, the subsampling, so compressed sensing, means that instead of measuring all those color products, I measure only a few of them. And these few of them are, are those that are indexed by this capital L set. And this, this, the size of this capital L set is little m. So basically, I just choose little m measurements at random. So instead of measuring the whole sequence, I just choose little m measurements. And the, basically, the idea of compressed sensing, and this is super simplified, so I apologize. Uh, the idea of compressed sensing is that recovery is possible whenever you take the number of measurements up to constants and log factors 
proportional to the sparsity of your unknown. So basically the zero norm of you. So you don't, the, the, the important aspect here is not the dimension of the space where your unknown lives. So the dimension of W in the language that I discussed before, but the sparsity of the unknown. And uh, so this is just a, a recap. And basically the, one of the key elements here is the coherence between these two family of, of, of vectors. On the one hand, the family with respect to which the unknown is sparse, so the phi j's, and the other one is the family with respect to which you take the measurements, so the psi l. So for example, this is well known in the typical MRI setup, let's say, where the measurements are just a Fourier basis and the sparsity is usually taken with respect to some sort of wavelets, shearlets, curvelets, or whatever. However, in these inverse problems for PDE, typically the situation is more complicated. You cannot have, for example, direct Fourier measurements. You will have something more complicated. And this is exactly the, the problem we've studied in this, in this paper. And basically, this addresses the linearized Gelfal Calderon problem. So it's a very, it's an inverse boundary value problem, very close to the Calderon problem that I discussed before. So far, we only have a result in the linearized regime, because so far, basically, the vast majority of the compressed sensing theory is in the, is in the linearized regime. And in that case, we were basically able to obtain exactly the same result that was known in the case of, say, Fourier basis and wavelet basis. So basically, one can actually recover your unknown by using little m uh, measurements chosen at random, provided that your unknown, your unknown potential is sparse with respect to a suitable wavelet basis. And this was basically done by using complex, compli um, complex geometrical optic solutions and the theory of compressed sensing generalized to a setting that is not somehow classical, where the forward map is not necessarily unitary, but it's just an invertible operator between, between Hilbert spaces. All right, so this is a second ingredient. So basically, we saw the linear subspaces. Then we saw compressed sensing to see how sparsity can play a role. The third <coughs> ingredient is basically a, a third level. And, and, and the question is whether one can consider nonlinear priors because so far we had finite dimensional linear spaces or still sparsity with respect to a linear dictionary. So we had uh, linear combinations of the phi j's. Can we go to the, can, can, somehow, can, can we go somehow to, uh, to consider also nonlinear prior, so nonlinear dictionary, nonlinear uh, spaces w's where our unknowns live? And in the, in the math in mathematical terms, considering a nonlinear object means to consider a manifold. So in this case, we abandon somehow the W, which was the finite dimensional space, but we consider a manifold capital M. So X is always my Banach space of signals, possibly infinite dimensional, and I consider a finite dimensional manifold of x and this the dimension of m i call it capital n i suppose that this manifold is c1 and the and, and this is just the atlas c1 means that the change of coordinates are c1 but it doesn't mean that m is embedded in x it means that, so basically it doesn't mean that the differentiable structure of m is the same as the differentiable structure of x it's only a, a manifold that is continuously embedded into x so basically the two topologies are the same but not the two differentiable structures and the key assumption that we make is that the inverse of the inverses of the charts need to be older continuous. This is not a strong assumption, assumption and it happens in all the examples that we have in mind. Um, so what are, the, what are the examples that we have in mind? For example, instead of having uh, piecewise constant functions over a fixed partition, which give rise to finite dimensional spaces, linear spaces. If you want to start moving your objects around, then somehow you, you lose the, the linearity and you will have a, a manifold somehow. So for example, if we have indicator functions on balls with variable centers, radii and intensities. So think about somehow a few ellipses around, you don't know where those ellipses or balls are, and you don't know how big they are and, and the intensities inside. This is not a linear subspace because those balls move around, but it's, it's gonna be a manifold. Uh, or if you don't want to consider balls, you can have simplexes, for example. So in 2D, it's just considering triangles or more generally polygons. And 
Finally, one could also think about generative priors. These, are, these have become very popular in the last couple of years and many, many times in this seminar series they've been mentioned. So basically this means that your manifold is just the image of a generator that goes from a low dimensional space through a neural network to the high dimensional space. I will come back to this particular case at the end. So in this, in this setup, we get basically what we proved was that we get exactly the same situation, exactly the same result as in the linear case. So here, basically, instead of having a, a, a finite dimensional subspace, we have a finite dimensional submanifold. So M now is a submanifold and not a subspace. But then the two assumptions on F are basically the same global injectivity, and that's exactly what we had before as well. The, the second assumption before we had the Frechet derivative. Now it doesn't make sense to consider the Frechet derivative anymore. The important object now is the differential of F when defined on the manifold M. So basically this differential will go from the tangent space and this differential has to be injective. Once you have these two assumptions, you get exactly the same result as before. The only difference if you want is that you don't get always Lipschitz stability, you may get holder stability in the case when your these maps here are only older continuous as, as, and not Lipschitz continuous. Uh, now for simplicity here, I, I've given you the only the result with full measurements. So here you see that I, I didn't put any projections. However, we have exactly an analogous result also with finite measurements. Just think about putting here Qn f of x, Qn f of y, where Qn has to satisfy, satisfy all the assumptions we discussed before. So basically the, the aim of this slide is just to show that everything I said before on the linear, in the linear case, so basically in the case where uh, the prior was modeled by a linear subspace can be extended mutatis mutandis basically to the case where um, your, your unknown lives in a finite dimensional manifold, in a low dimensional manifold. Again, exactly as before, this constant C will blow up in an inf in a, in a, in a imposed problem as the dimension of M uh, goes to infinity. And so the idea is that this uh, has to be low dimensional. So basically we, we want to approximate very well the, the, the unknowns that we, we want to recover to approximate them very well in a manifold so that the dimension N is kept low. And so this constant C is moderate. Let me just mention a technical point. As I said before, in the linear setting, uh, one key point was basically the linearization between X1 and X2 in the case where x1 and x2 were close to each other. And this was done basically by connecting x1 and x2 via a segment and apply basically the fundamental theorem of calculus anyway to go from the difference to the derivative somehow. And for doing this, we needed k to be convex. In this case, since we deal with a manifold, the manifold is then mapped to Rn via some charts, it's very difficult to enforce convexity in the Euclidean space because those charts, we do not have full control of those. And so somehow the proof needs to have a workaround for the lack of convexity of K somehow. This is a technical point, I don't want to go into that, but somehow it's not as easy as you could imagine because one could just say, oh, well, you just have the chart locally, it's a, it's a Euclidean space, so you just apply the result we had before. It's not that simple, the technicality, the result at the end is true, so the, the intuition is correct, but the technicalities are not so simple. All right, in the final part, so if I'm not mistaken, I should have five to 10 minutes more or less. Uh, in the final part of this talk, I want to mention something on learning. So basically in the case when the manifold M is not known because so far the, the outstanding assumption was always that either the linear subspace W or the manifold M were known. And then you had all those estimates, but what if M is not known, then typically, one approximates it via a generative model. So here I'm just uh, giving you some examples of the website, this person does not exist, where you just approximate the manifold of faces via a generative model, which is just a map from a low dimensional space to a high dimensional space. In our setting, this high dimensional space is an infinite dimensional space. So basically you have a generator that from a, a, a randomly sampled Gaussian uh, normal variable here on the left, in the latent space, you generate a random signal in the 
in the signal space. And so the idea is that if you have an inverse problem where somehow you have a you have a training set of, of typical signals that you want to recover, you first train a generator of this form and then you solve the inverse problem. Uh, so basically the manifold will just be the image of G through this, uh, this map. Uh, so basically these two approaches are on the one hand, the classical approach solving the inverse problem is just to solve directly what the equation Y equals F of X in the generative model approach is to assume that X lives in the manifold. So basically X is of the form G of Z. And so basically solving for Z instead of directly from X. So here I am, I'm, I'm assuming that X actually is in the range of G. G is just what I before I called phi minus one. So it's the parameterization of the manifold. And why does this help? Well, somehow we know it helps because we, you lower the dimensionality of the problem and so you restore stability. This is just an example on EIT. And you see that somehow this is a just standard regularized based approach. This is the ground truth. And this is an approach based exactly on this, uh, on this method, basically by learning a generator that approximates well to kind of lungs, uh, to kind of ellipses, let's say, in a, in a homogeneous background. So basically, this is just a simple example to show that indeed solving an inverse problem under this manifold assumption makes it much, much simpler. Now, let me, I want to study a little bit more the structure of the generator to see whether we can include this in our theory that I discussed before on the stability with unknowns living in a low dimensional manifold. So how, 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 uh, how is the generator constructed? Usually there is a first fully connected layer which maps basically a low dimensional vector here Z, here it's a 100 dimension 100 into many low dimensional images. So here we have many channels and very low dimensional images, very low resolution images. This is the first layer. And then all the other layers going from this uh, layer to the final layer, the final signal to the final image, usually you just put one after the other many convolutional layer. And so I'm sure you're, you're familiar with this kind of architecture. Now, the issue that somehow we faced was that our models were all infinite dimensions because those are based on PDEs. So we always have function spaces. So somehow I want my manifold to be containing a certain function space, say L2 or L infinity or whatever, uh, say L2, for example. So we wanted to model a generator whose output ended up in a continuous set, in a continuous function space. Now, there are many uh, works on. Uh, a few works on, on neural networks in, in the continuous setting, but somehow they do not address this, this specific structure of the convolutional uh, layers of the generator. So we try to do this and, and to explain how, how this structure is, is formed, let's first look at the, at the discrete architecture. So the discrete architecture of the convolutional layers works as follows. First of all, you start with a layer with many channels, so this is 100, uh, 1024, this is C1, many channels, but very low dimensional signals, and this is alpha 1. So C1 is large, alpha 1 is small. And then you keep going every time you reduce the number of channels, but you increase the size, the resolution somehow of the images. And so basically you reduce the channels and you increase the resolution. And every time you do convolutions, at the end, you end up with a one with only three channels, so basically only one image and with high of high resolution. And that's where you end up with. Every time you do convolutions, non-linearity, convolution, non-linearities. How can one model this increase of resolution in the continuous setting? The idea that came to our mind, it wasn't, of course, our idea, this was already somehow used in the scattering networks, was to use a multi-resolutional analysis. So basically all those spaces R alpha one, R alpha two, R alpha L are replaced by a, 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 a concatenated sequence of spaces of a multi-resolution analysis where the VJ are increasing spaces. So every time I go, I, 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 every time I, I go on with the layers, I consider a, a space in the multi-resolution analysis of increasing resolution. So we add finer scales and suppose you have a, a fixed wavelet here that is associated to this multi-resolution analysis. All right, so this is the structure that I want to focus on. Let me just mention one 
complication that actually in the in the analysis is 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 a key point. The complication is that since you have a nonlinearity here, the nonlinearity will typically kill the structure of these linear subspaces. And so basically every time you need to project back on the linear subspaces. This doesn't happen with pixels somehow, because if you have R, R to the alpha one and you apply nonlinearity, you still end up in R to the alpha one, but in the continuous setting, this creates a problem. But anyway, this is a technical point that is of course very key in the proofs, but doesn't appear too much in this presentation. All right. And uh, sorry, I missed one slide. The key property that I want to address here is the injectivity of G, the injectivity of the generator. We are not the first ones to study injectivity of networks. And of course, this is a key property for the for inverse problems. First of all, because the injectivity is the is uh, is key for inverse problems because for for inverting the map, you need a map that is injective. And more in, more in more precisely for our uh, abstract result with the manifolds if you don't have a manifold so the manifold has to be has to have a, a chart and this chart has necessarily need to be injective because it has to somehow be a, a, a homomorphism with uh, with a euclidean space so injectivity is a key is a key aspect and the main result that we've obtained is a result that somehow the statement is rather intuitive even though somehow the whole proof is rather involved and the the, the result is the following in order to have the a full the full network to be injective you need these conditions the first one the first map has to be injective so the the fully connected layer capital F has to be injective, then the nonlinearity at each step has to be injective so for example the relu at this moment is not allowed then all you have need to have a, a, con a linear a condition of linear independence of the convolutional filters at each iteration so basically the convolutional filters you need you consider cannot be all the same they have to be somehow linear independent here i'm skipping the precise conditions and finally you have to choose all the scales all the channels properly according to the stride that you use in the convolutions but this is just a technical point under those assumptions you get that g is indeed injective the difficulty here is that somehow every time you you keep going you you go on in the at each step of the network basically you reduce the number of channels and so by reducing the number of channels somehow you reduce the space and so basically this means this uh, gives us an indication of why ensuring injectivity may not be that easy because somehow you reduce the size of the space because the the, the number of the numbers of channel decreases at each step. So that's that's the key issue that somehow you need to you need to address and this is addressed exactly by using the properties of a multi-resolution analysis by using suitable wavelets. For example, all the hard wavelets or sorry, all the Dobeshi wavelets are okay in this setup. All right. I think I'm, I'm done with my time. Let me just conclude with, with one very simple slide. And the simple slide basically wants to convey the message that we started with inverse problems for PDE. This was the Calderon problem or the scattering problems for possibly other problems. And basically we tried to inject into those problems techniques that came from completely different domains like sampling, compressed sensing and machine learning. And somehow the benefits were in both sides because basically we applied ideas from here to obtain results that can be used in inverse problems for PDE, but on the other hand, those problems motivated somehow interesting results that can be interesting on their own in these, in these research areas. So with this, I conclude and I thank you very much for the attention. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Giovanni. It was really, really Thank interesting. You. Thanks Thank a lot you. again. Um, okay, so we have plenty of time for, uh, for questions and uh, discussions. So uh, I apologize on behalf of Eric because he wrote me that he had an issue with his laptop. So it is connected and maybe we'll be able to join, but he is not sure about it. Let's hope. So yeah, I, I, I encourage then people in the audience to ask questions using the chat or just raising their hands and I'll unmute and I'll unmute you. So I maybe break the ice with a sort of a, a numerical question I, I, I thought of. So you said that basically in the first part of your presentation, the, the proof you have for computing this, uh, this capital N is constructive. So basically you have a formula that depends on the dimension of the subspace. So would it make sense so how to verify numerically that 
this n is somehow the smallest or how, how sharp is the estimation of n such that uh, you can actually reconstruct, uh, you, have, you can have stability? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the true answer is I don't know. The, what I can tell you is the following. So, this. so that's yeah. your that's the the uh, the condition. So first of all, it's uh, um, so the the this this the end going out that comes out of this estimate comes because here we decided to put two c here. So basically, yeah. you can have you can decide to have a smaller number of measurements by having a larger constants here. So there is an interplay between the number of measurements and the constant that you end up having here. So somehow this means that the, there is no, in this setting, there is no an optimal number of measurements because this somehow connected to the stability that you want. If you want a better stability, you better pay a higher price in choosing the measurements. I see. Having mm -hmm. said that, uh, I, I do not know whether there's a, there's a simple recipe to say yes, this is exactly the number, the, the smallest number, because at the end of the day, you know, it's a, it's a discrete value. So there has to be a smallest mm. one. I do not know a recipe to say, yes, this is the smallest number so that there is a constant, uh, in our, whatever constant that, uh, that can appear in this red inequality, yeah. this I cannot tell, yeah. Or even I was thinking it's like uh, you have uh, too, too, too few ends, then you don't have stability, maybe on some uh, simple uh, test, uh, with low dimensional uh, no, no, sure. Yeah. This is, yeah. if n is too low, for sure, you may not have stability, mm -hmm. but this, if you want, you realize it very easily, even in a linear model with a simple matrix. You know, if you, if mm -hmm. you take a matrix yeah, yeah. that is too, uh, uh, too fat, then you don't get, you don't get, you don't even get uniqueness, injectivity somehow. Uh, somehow the nonlinearities here plays, of course, a role and it's, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to grasp uh, what's going on. Okay, thank you. No um, yeah, so uh, I, oh yeah, there is a question from Tram Guyen. So Tram, I will, uh, I hope I can, um, so it should be, yeah. I'm not sure why, but I cannot unmute Trump. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, I can allow to. Ah, thanks. Yes, I don't know why. Thanks. Ah, uh, no, no, no. I think uh, no. I think I think she's allowed. Yes, thanks. Trump, can you hear us? Maybe not. Ah, yes, yes. Now, now I we can hear something. Yes. Hello. We can hear you. Okay, so thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, I would mm -hmm. like to ask um, about uh, this exactly this uh, stability estimate for the neural network. Uh, you already mentioned, but I didn't catch all the detail. Can you uh, establish this uh, condition for neural networks? Yeah, so the answer is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, what I said was basically that so far, what we have is this abstract result for the manifold. Yeah. So if you know that your unknown lives in a manifold, then you are okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then the second thing that I, that I, that I, and, and somehow there are some assumptions on the charts. So basically that these charts have to be older continuous and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. The second thing that I, I said is if I, you, you have a manifold that, that is given as the image of a generator of this kind, Mm -hmm. then will this satisfy those assumptions? I think the answer is yes. So far, we haven't fully verified this. We haven't been able to do it yet. What the first thing we checked, the first very easy thing, well, it, it, we thought it was easy, but then it turned out to be complicated. The first thing we checked was whether this generator is injective. Mm -hmm. Because somehow the idea is that you go from a low dimensional space to a high dimensional space, where you expect some uh -huh. kind of injectivity. And, the, and, and that's what we wanted to prove. And this is somehow the, the assumption zero in this, in this setup because you need M to, be, to have a, a, an injective generator somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so this just was the, the assumption zero of the theorem. We, we, haven't been, we haven't done the full story yet, but we are quite optimistic that, that at the end of the day, it, it will turn out to be true. 
And uh, I guess this stability estimate will be useful for proving um, if one applies some regularization method, it would be useful as well, isn't it? Um, to reconstruct mm -hmm. uh, X? Yes, certainly. This is something that I haven't, this is something that I haven't mentioned. Somehow all these, and, and thank you for the question, somehow all these kind of mm -hmm. either holder stability of Lipschitz mm -hmm. stability mm -hmm. yep. imply sort of tangential cone conditions, <laughs> mm -hmm. which allow them to uh, make uh, um, iterative mm -hmm. algorithms for, uh, you know, for in, in regularization convergence, which is certainly something that we are very familiar with. So, so the answer is yes, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. By the way, we met at um, a conference um, in Klagenfurt. Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember Lisa. we discussed about so, this, yes. Yep, thank you yeah. very much, very nice talk. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Uh, so there is a question from uh, Laurent Bourgeois. So I, I will allow Laurent to speak. That should work. Okay, there can you, you hear me? Yes, yeah. very well. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for, for this talk. I have uh, a question about the, the Calderon problem. Yes. Uh, you, you said that the, in this case, the you, you had proved the injectivity of the Frechet derivative. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I, um, it, for me, it's clear that the, the, there is injectivity of the, of the Dirichlet to Neumann map, but yes. the, the Frechet the derivative, the injectivity of the Frechet derivative is not so clear for me. So I would be interesting to have a, a reference about that. Yes, okay, thank you. I, um, the, the thing is that somehow in our result, and, and if I said this, somehow I, 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 I take it back because somehow our result bypasses the, uh, the, the injectivity of the Frechet derivative because somehow the assumption is directly on the Lipschitz stability for F and then you get Lipschitz stability with finite measurements. So you see that here you do not have Frechet, the stability of the Frechet derivative. However, in all the theorems that I know of, this Lipschitz stability was always obtained by by looking at the at the injectivity of the Frechet derivative. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But this is something that I haven't done. I haven't done. We haven't done ourselves. Somehow, this is something that we took from the from a few papers. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with those. I mean, no, not here. Wait a minute. Where are they? Mm, here, I put a few a few names. Those are people who have worked on on similar problems. And as far as I remember. In many of these, they always try to bound by below the Frechet derivative of f. Okay, because uh, it's it's a difficult question because the, the of course the, the conductivity is positive, but if you the difference of two conductivities is not uh, positive anymore, so uh, this is why it's not uh, so simple. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, if you want, we can discuss it in. in Separately, I, I do not have fully in the in my head the whole proofs how it goes, but I'm sure that in that I've seen it okay. in, in many in many of these papers. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So any other questions? There's still some time and we can also stay a bit longer to discuss. So please ask. I had like, a, a, um, it's more probably a philosophical question. So maybe it's not really um, uh, specific, but uh, of course I like the, the, what you said about the fact that there is also the, the, the point of view of designing a good prior that plays a role like uh, in lowering down uh, the, the dimensions like uh, of your cell space, something that makes sense. So, I mean, <clears throat> Could this framework somehow be used to drive a little bit the selection of good priors? Uh, um, somehow to 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 look for solutions in uh, in spaces uh, um, natural for the prior that you impose for like specific number of uh, um, for a specific n for a specific dimension. I don't know. I mean, how do you see the interplay between basically these subspaces and the prior more in general? 
Well, um, so there is something that I haven't mentioned at all, which is the fact that, of course, as soon as you, you have, say, a mismodeling error, so your axes do not belong exactly to your space W, but they have a, a remaining term that is somewhere else. Yes. So say the X is almost piecewise constant, but still it's got something that is not piecewise constant. Then if you have a small remainder, then of course this remainder will show up here on the right. So you don't you will not get exact reconstruction, of course. And this is something that is quantified in the paper. So again, this is again a somehow the interplay if you choose a low a low W. Mm. Okay, in terms of number of measurements n and constant c, they, they, they are both small, but so of course you have you will have a high uh, error on the right or or vice versa. Uh, in if you have a severely imposed problem like EIT or scattering, then in all those cases, somehow it's fundamental to keep those constants small, otherwise the, the, the instability uh, will kill you. So in, in my experience, in those cases, it's very important to have a very, very strong prior. And as you said, it has, it has to adapt, to, to be very well adapted to your unknowns, which is probably why, you know, the new machine learning approaches are, are you know, they are not comparable in terms of uh, uh, performance with, you know, old stuff, because, you know, usually we would just minimize the L2 norm or the H1 norm or whatever. Now you really, you know, you, you really uh, represent the your unknowns much better with a, a, a much more adapted prior, and so things work better. 